star to a place unexpected Would you believe after all we projected A child in a manger Lowly and small, the weakest of all Unlikeliest hero Wrapped in his mother's shawl Just a child this who we've waited for Cause how many kings Stepped down from their thrones How many lords Have abandoned their homes How many greats Have become the least for me And how many gods Have poured out their hearts Romance a world that is torn all apart How many fathers gave up their sons for me Bringing out gifts for the newborn Savior All that we have, whether costly or me Because we believe for his honor and frankincense for his pleasure and mirth for the cross shall suffer do you believe this who we've waited for how many kings stepped down from their thrones how many lords have abandoned their homes how many greats have become the least for me? And how many gods have poured out their hearts To romance a world that is torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? Only one did that for me. have become the least how many gods have poured out their hearts romance a world that is torn all apart how many fathers gave up their sons for me only one did that for So, so good. 
team leading us in worship this morning. A few quick announcements before we uh, really get into it. Um, let's see. We'll have one big announcement for you here in a second, but before we get to that, um, the sock drive seems to be going well. We got a little bit more time. Again, that's a, a very uh, needed item in our community. And so, again, if you're at Walmart or Target, uh, throw an eight pack of sacks in your, or an eight pack of socks in your cart and, uh, and bring them in. Don't get eight saxophones, that doesn't make sense, right? Uh, there's a family ski day coming up, February 26th, uh, at Andy's, I believe. Um, if you're a skier, if you like to get your kids out on the slopes, I think it's half price everything, so it's a pretty reasonable way to ski. A, not, a, not a huge hill, but uh, a good place to learn, have a little bit of fun. Young in Spirit will be meeting on February 3rd, and uh, this is an interesting and educational opportunity uh, for our senior members here. Uh, we have an officer from the Moorhead Police Department coming to talk about a very important topic, and that's fraud. Uh, there's all sorts of tricksters out there, and their methods are always changing and, and adapting, and so we need to be uh, up to speed with, with those cons that, uh, that those scammers are running. So, so please, even if you're not a regular member of our Young and Spirit activities, this, this very well might be worth your time. might save you some some heartache and some money, too. Uh, we'll have a prayer service breakfast, and this is a ways off, February 26th, but you can, you can mark your calendar for that. Uh, all women are invited. Um, at this time, I want to ask Dan, uh, Dan Biebighauser, sorry, Dan, to come up and make an announcement about our youth group.
morning. As Pastor said, I'm Dan Bibikauser. I'm one of the adult leaders for the National Youth Group Gathering trip that we're sending from our congregation this summer to Houston, Texas. And um, I wanted to start by thanking you for the support you've given us so far. Uh, you might be aware that there's a pretty big football game coming up in a few weeks, and sometimes I'm watching the game, it's like, I could really just enjoy a nice sub sandwich right now. And thankfully, our youth, as you can see on the front cover, are going to be putting together some sub sandwiches for that day. So um, there's going to be two different sizes, a six inch for $6 suggested, 12 inch for $12, that's easy to remember. And um, we'll be taking orders these next few weeks out in the uh, lobby. There'll be some youth out there with order forms who can answer your questions. Those orders have to be in by February 6th because then the youth will make them and they'll be available to pick up on the 13th, which is the day of the big game. There will also be an online order form coming out in the weekly email this week. So I encourage you to order some subs to support our youth and our trip to the uh, gathering in Houston and encourage others to uh, order subs as well and uh, start building up your appetites. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Yeah, a, a wonderful fundraising opportunity. You know, you get something good. It really helps out our youth group. So uh, please consider, please put the word out there. You know, uh, any friends or family, it's a good time to make, make a little bit of cash for our youth group as they look forward to the National Youth Gathering. Uh, one other little announcement. If you're kind of the head of a board or a committee and you would like to submit something to our annual report, please get those in as soon as possible. I think last week I told you you're okay because I haven't gotten mine in yet. Well, mine's in, so the uh, <laughs> clock is ticking there. All right, I think that's all we have for announcements today. It's great to, great to see all of you. Thanks for getting here on this snowy morning. I know the, the roads aren't great. and It's pretty cold outside, so appreciate you being here. We stand at this time. We share a Christian greeting, and our praise team will lead us in our next song. You may be seated. sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come kneel earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal so lay down your burden Come sit at the table, come test the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. Lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are Yeah. 
for the morning, O sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your begin our service in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts, thankful that you have regarded us as your beloved sons and daughters, worthy of your grace and salvation. Lord, send your Holy Spirit upon us today to believe evermore in our Savior, Jesus Christ, to empower us to live a lives that are worthy, worthy of the calling that we have received. Lord, we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The scriptures teach us some good news. That if we confess our sins, we have a God who is faithful and just, who will hear us and forgive us of all our unrighteousness. The Bible also tells us that if we say that we have no sin, then we are lying to ourselves. We deceive ourselves and the truth does not reside within us. And so this morning, I ask all of you, do you acknowledge that you are sinners, that you have sinned in the things that you have said, the things that you have done, the things that you have left undone? Do you confess that you are a sinner, that you are by nature sinful? If so, say, I confess. I confess. But there is good news. Jesus Christ came into our world, took on our human flesh, lived under the law, was obedient to the law, and yet offered himself up as an atoning sacrifice for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be reconciled to our God and our maker. So I ask you this day, do you believe that Jesus Christ has paid for your sins? Do you believe that you've been absolved of all of the guilt of your sins? Do you believe you can stand before God with a pure heart, and a clean conscience. If so, say, I believe. I believe. Then it is my privilege as your pastor to announce the forgiveness of God to all of you, to announce his grace and his mercy that is abundant every day. Go forth in the peace of the Lord, repent of your sins, and do the good works that God has created you to do. Amen. This time we invite our children to come forward for the children's message. Boys and girls, come on up. There's a whole bunch of room right here, too. A big space. All right. How's everybody doing today? Good. I'm glad you're here. It's good to see you today. All right. I would like you to look at the ceiling with your elbow. Okay. I want you to smell with your ear. Ready? Okay. I want you to give me a thumbs up with your knee. Well, that's okay. That was kind of silly, right? Okay, if we wanted to look at the ceiling, what would we use? 
our eyes. Okay, everyone look at the ceiling with your eyes. Whoa. Okay, if we were going to smell instead of our ear, what should we use? Nose. Our nose. Ready? Let's smell. Okay. And if you were to give me a thumbs up instead of our knee, what should we use? Our thumb. Yeah, our hand to give a thumbs up. You know, God created our bodies to do certain things. Our eyes are what we see with. We can't see with our elbow. That's goofy. Okay. Our noses are created to smell. Our ears are created to hear. Our feet are created to walk. We can't use those things for something else. It just doesn't work. Okay. Sometimes maybe we can try and go without. Okay. But God gave us specific things to use our bodies for. Certain parts of our body are for certain things. And you know what? In the Bible, God says that the whole people of God, all the people out here and all of us, are like a body. Which means that we all have certain gifts that are used for certain things. Just like our eyes are used to see, God gives us gifts to do certain things. So let's see. God gives people gifts to be greeters, to say hello and welcome people. Not everyone is comfortable doing that, but God has given gifts to people. What about a Sunday school teacher? Not everyone is comfortable teaching Sunday school, but some people are, and God has given gifts to people to be teachers, and God has given gifts to people to be quilters, and to be, we talked about teachers, and to be welcomers, and to be servers, and be helpers. God has given us all special jobs, and so we can love him and use them as we serve. We're the body. Not everyone is a greeter. Not everyone is a teacher, but we can all do different things because we love Jesus and to serve our church, okay? Let's fold our hands and let's say a prayer today. Dear Jesus, thank you for giving us gifts to serve you. Help us to use them well. I love you, Jesus. Amen. All right, you guys can take a seat. The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 12. For just as a body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one, if, 
one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you who are the body of Christ and individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. This is the word of the Lord. Stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came, came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they had heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We continue on in the season of the Epiphany today. Epiphany is a season in the church year uh, in which we Think about how Christ revealed himself, not just to his people, the Jewish people, uh, but to all people, Jews and Gentiles alike. And, and we start in Epiphany thinking about who was invited to come worship the king. Back when Jesus was very, very little, it wasn't just the shepherds outside of Bethlehem, but it was the wise men, men who were not Jews, men from a far off land. They followed the star and they presented their gifts to Christ. The season of Epiphany is about how Christ is being revealed to everyone. Right? Simeon talks about that. We talked about Simeon a few weeks ago, right? Receives the boy Jesus in the temple. He sings this little song about how his eyes have seen the glory of his people Israel and a light to the nations as well, the Gentiles. Jesus is revealed in the season of Epiphany. We talked about Jesus' baptism, right? Where the voice of God the Father calls down and says, this is my son. Jesus is revealed to those who came out for the baptism at the Jordan. Last week, we talked about how Christ is revealed through his miracles. 
His first miracle, specifically last week, we talked about Jesus' first sign in the Gospel of John, turning water into wine at the wedding of Cana. And today we'll take another look at how Jesus is revealed during the season of Epiphany. We'll look at his return home to Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth, he goes home after going around the region, going in Capernaum, teaching and performing some miracles, teaching in parables. He returns home and he goes to church. This story is interesting. Last week we talked about how he, how he reveals himself by doing a miracle. And what's interesting about today's text is Jesus' refusal to do a miracle. Instead, we'll focus more on how Christ reveals himself through his own word, through his own teaching and preaching. Jesus goes to church. I think that's a lesson worth uh, thinking about just a little bit, you know. Why do we go to church? That's a whole sermon, maybe a whole sermon series. Why do we go to church? It's a question a lot of us maybe take for granted. Some of us struggle with. Why should I get out of bed when it's still dark and there's this much snow in the road and, you know, get dressed and get the kids dressed and, and get to church. Well, Jesus goes to church. That's good to know. That is his custom. He's in Nazareth. He goes to church. He goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And as a rabbi on this day, he selected to take the scroll of Isaiah. Just like we have lectionary readings, there's a schedule of readings in the Jewish synagogues. And the reading for that day Isaiah chapter 61. They wouldn't have called it Isaiah 61. Chapters and verses didn't come around till the Middle Ages. But he found the place in Isaiah's scroll where there was this messianic prophecy. They do show up in the Old Testament more than you might think. Isaiah 61 talks about how the Spirit of the Lord has anointed this Messiah. Anointed. That's a big word in the scriptures. You know, we all know Jesus as Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, but what does that word Christ mean? Well, it means the anointed one, the one who is set apart, the one who is promised. You think about the story of David, when he's the youngest brother of his father Jesse, and he's out in the fields, and the prophet comes by to anoint the next king of Israel after Saul, and the older brothers don't make the cut. Are there any more brothers? Well... There's David. And there, before he becomes king, David is anointed with oil, sort of set apart for the task of being the king of Israel. Jesus is the Christ. That's the confession of the church, the confession the church is built on. Is Jesus of Nazareth the Christ, the anointed one, the one who is set apart to be the savior of the world or not? And the prophecy that Jesus is reading from Isaiah 61 talks about how the Spirit of the Lord is upon the Anointed One, upon the Christ, so that good news would be preached to the poor, so that liberty would be given to the slaves, the prisoners, the captives, how sight would be restored to the blind, how freedom would come to those who were oppressed. Jesus reads this little section of Isaiah's scroll, I guess. You don't want to call it a book at that time. It's a scroll. And he rolls it up, and he gives it back to the attendant. And everyone's wondering what he's going to say. Everyone in the synagogue is, is very attentive. Because they'd heard some rumors about this Jesus. That he was off, you know, in neighboring regions. Maybe he was healing people. He was preaching and parables. He was drawing a crowd. Maybe they'd heard about his, his work in Cana at the wedding. And they're wanting to know if Jesus is the real deal or not. So they've sort of leaned forward in their chair. The scriptures tell us that all eyes were fixed on Jesus. And it was the custom in the synagogue, very much like it is today, is after you do the scripture reading, you come out and you teach about it. You preach about it. That's what it is to be a rabbi. You're a teacher. Except they got to sit down while they did it, <laughs> which makes me a little jealous. I have to stand or you guys would look at me funny. But Jesus sits there in front of the people and he delivers his message. 
And it's an interesting message. He just read from the scroll of Isaiah this messianic prophecy. He preaches maybe one of the shortest sermons ever. He says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What does this mean? Jesus says, you know that scripture I just read about the Messiah, about the anointed one that the Spirit dwells upon? That's about me. I, I can't get away with preaching a sermon like that, but maybe Jesus couldn't either. It's interesting. At first, the people marvel at Jesus. It seems like the temperature in the room is pretty favorable for Jesus. They marvel at his wisdom, his grace. They contemplate what it means that, that one of theirs, Jesus, who's done these miracles, might actually be the long-promised Christ, the Messiah. It seems like there's real excitement in the room. But then something happens. The temperature goes down, the mood shifts in the room, and, and it's hard to tell exactly what happened. Maybe there were a couple of naysayers or detractors, or maybe Jesus can sort of figure out the intention of their heart. We don't know exactly the details of what happened, but someone says, wait a second, isn't that Joseph's son? You know, isn't that the carpenter? Didn't, didn't he build my table? He didn't really say that, but that's, that's sort of the idea. Like, this guy who's sitting up here claiming to be the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, we know his dad. We know his mom. We know his brothers, who aren't believers, by the way. And the brothers are listed out here, the brothers of Jesus. You know, there's James, who would go on to become a great believer and a leader of the church and write the epistle of James and, and Judas who would write that little letter called Jude and there's another brother named Joseph and, and Jesus has sisters, we learn that here the people are saying well, let's pump the brakes here because this, this guy, this Jesus this carpenter he's just from our hometown of Nazareth and we know his dad, we know his mom we know his brothers, we know his sister and it seems like maybe what they want, what they need in this moment is for Jesus to perform some of the miracles like the ones he's been doing in neighboring regions. Right? They're not going to believe just yet. Not going to believe. And Jesus knows the intentions of their heart. He senses their unbelief. He senses their skepticism. And he has some interesting words to say, maybe some hard words to say. He speaks in these sort of proverbs. He says, a prophet has honor except in his hometown and among his people. Maybe you've heard this proverb before. Maybe you've lived this proverb before. A prophet without honor. You know, there, there are other sayings that we use that kind of convey the same idea, like you can never go home again or uh, familiarity breeds contempt. You know, I, I, I've experienced a little bit, a portion of what Jesus experiences here. I don't want to overstate things, but I am a pastor who's gone home to preach before. And it's kind of a terrible, uncomfortable situation. You don't let on that it is, but it's, it's, it's kind of a no-win situation. Either you get up there and you kind of stink, you kind of bomb in front of all of your friends and family, and that's no good. But if you preach a decent, competent sermon, you're constantly reminded that they don't really see you as a pastor. Not really. Because there's, there's this handshake line after church. Right? I remember the first time I went home to preach, and uh, it was a very interesting handshake line. You know, I, I, I met with Miss Louise, who, who ran our Christmas program every year, and she was just ooing and aahing and oh Sammy I remember when you were a wise man in the Christmas program and look how big you've gotten and how you know it was just it warmed my heart so much to see you up there and like it's fine 
it's fine. I, it's, it's nothing wrong with Miss Louise, but it's, it's this sort of idea of, if I'm supposed to be the preacher and I'm supposed to be up there proclaiming the word of God and you're, you're thinking of me with a painted on beard carrying, you know, a cardboard uh, box of frankincense, right? Then maybe, maybe you were missing the point. Maybe you weren't really listening to the word that I was trying to proclaim that day. And then you run into the folks who can't quite let you be a pastor. I've experienced that even recently. I'm not like a brand new pastor. I've been doing this since, I don't know, about seven years or something like that. The last time I went home to preach, you know, there are some members of my home congregation who are better pastors than the pastor, you know, and they're going to let you know how you did. You know, they're going to critique certain points of your sermon and, oh, the law wasn't as strong there as it was. And, and maybe the gospel didn't come through as clearly as you would like. And there are some characters in my home congregation. But the point is, it's hard to go home. Like, there's this idea of going home to preach, especially if you want to preach authoritatively, where maybe people are a little bit too distracted that you used to be a baby in that congregation, you know? And who are you to preach to me what the Word says? And so this is Jesus' experience. This is the carpenter. We know his parents. We know his brothers and sisters. Except Jesus isn't just preaching the Word of God. He's claiming to fulfill the Word of God. And the people are struggling with this. At first they go, wow, that's pretty cool. And then the gears start turning and they say... I'm not sure we like that. We're not sure you should be our Lord. We saw you grow up. We saw you run in the streets. And so Jesus starts to talk about two stories from the Old Testament. Both from, well, one from 1 Kings, one from 2 Kings, but they're about Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha. The prophets of the Lord during the time of the kings. And uh, we talked about this this summer as we went through the Old Testament stories. We talked about Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Maybe you remember that story. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and, and how they weren't happy uh, with, with uh, Elijah because Elijah was preaching a word of condemnation. And, uh, and, and God says, okay, if you're not going to repent. See, they'd turn to false gods, the king and the queen. And God says, if you're not going to repent, I'm not going to let it rain. There's going to be a drought and there's this big, long drought, three and a half years, and nothing grew, and everyone's starving. And Elijah's a wanted man, and he goes to a foreign land, the land of Zarephath and Sidon. And there's this widow, and she has a son, and they are out of food. They have enough flour, enough oil to make one more meal, and they're going to make it, and they're going to eat it, and then they're going to starve to death. That's the plan. Elijah goes to these people, binds them as the Lord commanded them to. He says, make for me some bread. She's like, this is all I got left. Elijah says, it's okay. So she uses the last of her flour, the last of her oil. She makes some cakes of bread for Elijah. He eats. But wouldn't you know it, through this miraculous intervention from God, during the remainder of the drought, the flour never runs out nor does the oil. And, and, and Elijah lives with this widow and, and even sort of heals and resurrects her son. That's a whole story that I don't want to get into too much. But the point that Jesus wants us to see here, and he says it, there were a lot of widows in Israel that weren't helped. But there was this foreign widow in Zarephath who was. Right? The people of Nazareth, they were Israelites. They were Jews. And Jesus is sending them a message, and he doubles down on that message. You think about the prophet Elisha. Right? There were a lot of people with leprosy in Israel, but Elisha doesn't heal them. Instead, the Syrian army commander named Naaman approaches Elisha, seeking to be healed. And Elisha tells him to go to the river to sort of dive in, and he'll come up and he'll be healed. Well, Jesus makes the point, there are a lot of people with leprosy in Israel, but, but who does the Lord heal? It's not the Israelite here. It's the Gentile. And so, what's the point that Jesus is making here? 
If you're going to reject me as my own people, as my hometown, so be it. I've been sent to all people, and Gentiles will accept me. And this is going to foreshadow a big part of Jesus' ministry. As he goes forth from here, this is going to be a theme that comes up time and time again. Those who should be receiving him, those who should hear Isaiah 61 and rejoice, they're going to have problems with Jesus. They're going to seek to kill Jesus. You think about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, the chief priests, the religious elite. No, but who's going to accept Jesus? The sinners, the tax collectors, the Samaritans. And so Jesus is preaching to them and teaching them that if you don't accept me, I'll move on. So be it. And the people understand what Jesus is saying. When he talks about the widow of Zarephath, when he talks about Naaman, the Syrian army commander, they know what Jesus is saying, and they are enraged. They are filled with wrath, the scriptures tell us. And this mob sort of whips up, and they drive Jesus out of the synagogue to this tall place in Nazareth, to this cliff, and they're seeking to throw him off this cliff and kill him. This is how upset they are. They've a They've been so offended. The scriptures say they, that they've been scandalized. That's the word in Greek, scandalon. They've been so uh, offended. Jesus has become a, a stumbling block for them, and they feel that their best course of action is just to get rid of Jesus, one of their own, one that they were marveling about just a few minutes before. And then something really strange happens. It's one of those big question marks in scripture uh, Luke doesn't elaborate on exactly how this transpired, but they get to this cliff, this mob of people seeking to kill Jesus, but it's not Jesus' time to die yet. And so the scriptures say that Jesus passed through their midst. Jesus decided it's not time to die yet, and so he's just not going to allow himself to be thrown off this cliff and killed. Now, how did this take place? We don't know exactly. You know, did Jesus turn into some sort of apparition and they couldn't get their hands on him? Who, probably not, right? Did he disappear, right? Because Jesus, after his resurrection, it's like, like he appears in the upper room to Thomas and the disciples. Is it that sort of thing where he just disappears? The way I've always thought about it is kind of like the Daniel and the lion's den situation. Daniel goes into the lion's den, all right, the, the lion should have torn him limb from limb, but God sort of closes their jaws, and they bring no harm upon Daniel. That's sort of how I envision this, but the Bible doesn't really elaborate. It's just that the way I envision it is like the people are sort of just stopped, almost paralyzed, and Jesus just walks through the crowd. The point is, Jesus has a homecoming that doesn't go so well, and we learn some things, some very important things from this story. First, before it all goes bad, we get this great reminder of who Jesus is. Jesus, in no uncertain terms, tells us when he tells the synagogue in Nazareth that he is the anointed one, that he is the Christ. And that's the meaning of the season of Epiphany. Have no doubts about that. And you'll have people tell you from time to time, you'll hear a radio program or a television show, or, you know, you'll learn that, oh, Jesus was a great moral teacher, he's a great example to follow, but, but he wasn't really the Christ, he wasn't really the Messiah. And some will even tell you that he never claimed to be. Well, that's just not true based on scripture, but people will try to convince you that. Here, when Jesus preaches in church, what does he say? Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is the anointed one. The Holy Spirit did abide on him. We saw that in Christ's baptism. He did proclaim good news to the poor. He did restore sight to the blind. He did preach freedom to those enslaved by sin. Make no mistake about it, Jesus is the Christ. That's the first big lesson here. You know, with all the drama that happens, we shouldn't lose sight of Jesus' actual message here. 
The second thing to take away from this, and I think this is equally important, and this is very good news for you and me, is that we learn that Jesus came to save all people. See, the prevailing wisdom about this Messiah was that he would be there to redeem God's chosen people, the Israelites. But we're going to see throughout Jesus' ministry that Jesus came to save everyone. God so loved the world. And we see this in Jesus' dealings. We see this in Jesus' teachings. And it's reflected by what his apostles do. Right? Jesus sends his disciples to all nations to baptize and teach. We see that in the book of Acts. We see that in the, in the missionaries of the early church. Jesus came to be a savior of all. Jew and Gentile. When he teaches about the widow of Zarephath, when he teaches about, about Naaman, the leper, he's telling us something, that God has chosen us as well. So a couple of things for us to think about. Familiarity breeds contempt. That's, that's one of the interesting lessons of the story, that Jesus, yes, at times is rejected, but in his own hometown. That must have been somewhat painful to be rejected by your own people. Familiarity breeds contempt. They were familiar with Jesus and they just couldn't quite believe. I think one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, has our familiarity with the story of Christ, the story of the gospel, made us sort of contemptuous to it? Are we still receiving the good news of Jesus as it was intended, as actual good news? It's important that we abide in God's word, that we're reminded of forgiveness and life constantly. But have we heard this message so many times that, that it almost doesn't, we almost don't hear it anymore. We haven't meditated on it. We haven't valued this message in some time. There's always a risk of that. You hear, Jesus loves me enough. That Jesus died to take away my sins enough. Have you sort of tuned it out? My friends, don't tune it out. It is the best news that you can hear. Think about what that means today. You were in the bondage of sin. Christ has come to free you. You were spiritually poor. Jesus has made you rich. You were spiritually blind, right? unable to perceive the things of God. Christ has opened your eyes. You've been made amazing promises by Christ. Don't let your familiarity with these promises make you contemptuous to them. Don't take them for granted. Jesus was taken for granted by his own people. Make sure that we are not taking Christ for granted, but always receiving his good news with joy and with trust. That's an important lesson to think about today. And I think the other thing to think about when we apply this text to our life is this idea of rejection. You read pretty much any Bible, and there's these editorial headings and pretty much in every translation I've ever read of this story, it's called, Jesus is rejected in Nazareth. Rejection. It's a great fear of ours, isn't it? Rejection. I remember being, well, a kid, a teenager, even a young adult, and rejection was one of my greatest fears. You think about it in a romantic sense. I mean, how many of you had some crush on a boy or a girl and, and, you know, you weren't going to die. No one was going to, nothing bad was really going to happen if you asked them on a date and they said no, or asked them to dance and they said no. But your fear of being rejected was so powerful, you just sort of turned inward on yourself and, and, never, and never asked that person on a date. Like, that, that's sort of a silly example, but you think about it, rejection is a great fear we have. And maybe it's in our careers pursue that promotion, to pursue that next job, and is there a fear that we're going to get a no? 
And what is that no going to make us feel about ourselves? That we're unworthy, not good enough, never going to be good enough. Rejection. Jesus lived in a world of rejection. I want you to remember that. Jesus lived in a world of rejection. We see it here, big and bold, and how he's rejected in his hometown. But Jesus is rejected throughout his ministry. By his disciples at times. Right? You think about Holy Week. You think about Peter's denial. You think about Judas' betrayal. You think about how he died essentially alone. Jesus faced rejection all the time from his own people, from those who came out in droves to hear him teach, right? Maybe they're the ones who were yelling, crucify him on Good Friday. Jesus lived with rejection all the time. But he was undeterred. He was undeterred. Sometimes our greatest fear in living out our Christian lives in the way that we know we ought to is this fear of rejection. The fear of other people rejecting us because of our faith and people rejecting the message of Christ. And so it makes us afraid. It makes us afraid to share the good news of Jesus. What if people reject it? What if people reject me for delivering this message? My friends, they rejected Jesus. And some of them are going to reject you too. But look to Jesus. Did that stop him? Did that discourage him? Did it cause Jesus to change his course, to change his values, to change his mission? No. Don't let it change your mission. The world rejected Christ. And Christ tells us that if we truly follow him, we will face rejection from the world at every turn. But don't let it hurt you. Don't let it stop you. Go forth in boldness. Go forth trusting the Lord that even though the world might reject you, God accepts you. And that's what really matters. At the end of the day, at the end of our lives, the rejection of man, in a sense, is a badge of honor. Right? Because if you're too accepted by the world, you might be far from the heart of of Christ, the one who was rejected. So I think that's a big lesson to learn from this as well, to think about what rejection means in your life and and let Christ kind of take the sting out of that rejection so that you can live the kind of life that Christ has called you to live unafraid and undeterred. Jesus Christ came home. It didn't go well. The thing I think about this message is that As Jesus leaves Nazareth, as he walks through the midst of this angry mob, he just keeps walking. He keeps walking out of town. He goes back about his mission. And we know where that mission is leading. It's ultimately leading to the cross. It's leading to the cross. Jesus didn't stay there and reason with the people of Nazareth. He didn't debate with the people of Nazareth. He didn't do miracles to prove to them that he was the Christ. Instead, he knew what the people of Nazareth really needed. They needed a savior. And so he just left town. And he just kept walking. And he went to the cross. He went to the cross and he died for them. He died for us as well. So what may look like sort of a defeat for Jesus, a bad day for Jesus, we're reminded of how it all ended up. Jesus left town to go to the cross, to die for those in Nazareth, to die for us as well. And that's pretty good news. We are not rejected. We are accepted. Thanks be to God. Amen. We stand for prayer. In our prayers this morning, we lift up to God for healing and strength Joe Duke, Marla Ziegler, Shelley Nitschke, Dave Seibel, Joanne Fickner, Keith Strand, Ethel Duke, Dalen Schmitz, Doug Thorson, Shirley Tilke, Joan, Joan Mueller, Danielle Miller, 
Ruth Novotny, Joshua Snow, Gail Friesen, and Mavis Chan, our, our Wednesday night uh, accompanist, her grandson James um, is dealing with some aggressive cancer. We, we remember him in our prayers as well. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today. We ask that you bless your church scattered throughout the world. This congregation, our Redeemer, song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you oh. Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside. Breathe. 
our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We sing our closing song. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness and find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us forever. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there. Oh, For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to the Savior. benediction of our Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I want to thank the praise team for leading us in worship this morning. Uh, love to see you downstairs for adult Bible class. Love to see the kids in Sunday school. Again, order your sandwiches. There's a sign-up table just out there. And uh, tell your friends. It's a good opportunity for everyone. Uh, God bless you this day. Just remember that uh, Jesus was rejected in his hometown, but he was undeterred. Don't, don't, uh, don't be discouraged when you face rejection and trials in this world. Just remember the good news of Jesus. Uh, he is the truth. So God bless you all. See you in the hallway. <laughs>